Our first scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, we're going to read the first 13 verses. As we begin a new sermon series, I'm going to do a little bit different. Instead of having an Old Testament and New Testament reading, we're going to do both New Testament readings. So 1 John chapter 5, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 13. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. Whoever does not believe God has made Him a liar because He has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning His Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And now we turn to the Gospel of John. We're going to start our series in John called Witness, but we're going to begin at the end today. So I would encourage you to turn to John 20. I'm going to read verse 30 and 31, and then we'll go to John 21, verse 24 and 25. So John 20, verse 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then the last two verses of chapter 21, verse 24 and 25. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did where every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh God, who so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lead us. Lead us as we delve into this gospel account. And may our time spent in John impact us, engage us, and enlist us. For Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. If you have no compassion for those who lead worship, hopefully today you'll begin to have compassion because it's hard to lead worship when there's no hardly anybody here. And so um, it's great when they get through all of that. I'm glad that they make it through. Uh, you have the, worship, the, the sermon notes on the back of your worship guide. At the bottom, there's some questions there for the kids and for you adults. And I'm going to make reference to one of those questions towards the end of the sermon. And hopefully you receive the chart that was sent to you in the email as well. That will be important for you to have. Maybe take it and put it in your Bible. Print it out and put it in your Bible. So who ever heard of reading a book starting at the beginning? All right, this is Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road. It kept me up with nightmares because I would read it at night and then I would just have nightmares all night long. But here's Cormac McCarthy. Who would take Cormac McCarthy or Agatha Christie or Tom Clancy book and start reading it at the end? At the, when you start reading it, you start at the end. Well, to tell the truth, I actually do it all the time. I do it with novels. I do it with theology books and Bible study books. 
When I'm doing it with novels, I usually start the first few pages, then run to the end to see, to make sure the story's going to turn out okay. (laughs) But I also want to see if there are any hints at the ending of the story, any hints that I need to look for, like names and clues and locations that will come up at the end. Well, we're going to actually do that with the gospel according to John. Today I'm going to start at the end. I think I'm clearly convinced it will help us as we hurl ourselves into this study and hopefully clear up a few things ahead of time. Therefore, here's the five points. Therefore, we are going to address assumptions and then we're going to examine audiences, then focus on aspiration, then prepare ourselves to advance, and then set up arrangements. Five A words. I thought that would be easier that way. Assumptions, audiences, aspiration, advance, and uh, arrangements. So let's begin with assumptions. We ourselves, following John's lead, as he lays it out here in these verses we just read, following John's lead, we need to approach the gospel record with a few assumptions. So I'm going to give you three that are specifically laid out by John himself and one that I think is important that's kind of outside this passage. First off, as we begin here at the end, we see that there is more to the story than just what we have recorded in these pages. Chapter 20, verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. And then chapter 21, verse 25, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. There's more to the story. Now, most times we intuitively recognize that when we pick up a biography or history. You know, I love Teddy Roosevelt biographies, and you know when you pick up a Teddy Roosevelt or uh, a biography written by uh, David McCullough or Stephen Ambrose, you know there's more to the story. They, They don't have a large number of pages that they can print out for the story, right? So they're leaving out lots of things. You know that intuitively. But it needs to be said, and here's why. If we recognize and acknowledge that that John has left out other aspects of the story, then we realize that John is not going to answer every one of our questions and queries about why or how or where or when. He's not going to answer every one of our questions. And why is that important? Because we'll have lots of questions. And sometimes we'll sit around and go, well, why did that happen? And John says, nothing. Well, 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 what's the purpose of this? And then there's this silence, right? And that helps us to then be content with the things he doesn't address. We can speculate all day long. But sometimes speculations get us in a heap of trouble, as they used to say, right? So it's very helpful for us to know right at the very beginning there's more to the story than is here. Secondly, John tells us we need assurances. That's why he says he wrote this gospel. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then in chapter 21, 24, the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, we know that his testimony is true. John is piling up assurances because we need assurances. And if you were listening to our first reading in 1 John 5, did you notice he says that several times? I write this so that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. We Christians need assurances. It's okay. We need assurances, and so this gospel is written for that. And so that's an assumption we address, we approach this gospel with. I need assurances, and this gospel is coming to give those things. Further, and this is our third assumption, is that the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. They are one and the same. The Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. And we're very good conservative uh, evangelical Presbyterians, and that's not our kind of language. But that language came up to me when I first read J. Gresham Machen's book from the 1920s or 30s called Christianity and Liberalism. And he points out in that book that that is how staunchly liberal, quote, Christianity, end of quote, actually deals with Jesus. That there's the Jesus of history who probably didn't do nine-tenths of the things that are cataloged, And then there's the Christ of faith. 
Do you ever read a P.D. James novel? She wrote uh, a novel called Death and Holy Orders, and she has one of her clerics say that when there's doubt about the resurrection of Jesus, the cleric is asked, well, does it matter? And he says, oh, that's just a bunch of bones. What does it matter? The only thing that matters is I have a relationship with the living Christ. That's the way of liberalism, that the Jesus of history is separate from the Christ of faith. But notice that John is pounding home that the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith are one and the same. You cannot separate them. There was a fellow, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who later then became Pope Benedict XVI, who pointed this out very well in his book, Jesus of Nazareth. And I've given you the quotation there. He wrote, quote, if we push this history aside, Christian faith as such disappears and is recast as some other religion. Now, before I read any further of his quotation, that's the exact same point made by J. Gresham Machen in his book, Christianity and Liberalism. When you take the history out, it's a totally different religion using our language, but not what we mean. Okay? Ratzker uh, Pope Benedict XVI hits the nail on the head well. He goes on to say, we are not meant to regard Jesus' activity as taking place in some sort of mythical anytime, which can mean always or never. It is a precisely datable historical event having the full weight that real historical happenings have. Very helpful so remember, that's the third assumption as we come to the Gospel of John, that John is pounding home that the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. Without the Jesus of history, there is no Christ of faith. Here's the last assumption, and this is one that I just am adding because I think it's important for us. That as we read the Gospel according to John, we are not to hold the author to a strict chronological order, but we are to hear the gospel and perceive that it is written actually around a thematic order. There's where that chart that I sent to you is very helpful, where he shows how all those, there are thematic chunks within the gospel of John. But let me give you a clear, quick example. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have show and remind us that Jesus cleared the temple, closed it down and cleared it out at the end while he was in Jerusalem right before he was crucified. John takes that historical moment, that historical event, and he fast forwards it and brings it to John chapter 2 because John is actually hammering home the theme that the temple is going away and Jesus is shutting it down because Jesus is the temple. So there's an example. So remember, when we're reading John, do not hold him to strict chronological order. That's what you do with Luke. Luke tells you to do that. Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4. You do that with Luke. With John, you look for the thematic order. Thematic order. So these are four, at least four of the basic assumptions we need to take with us as we investigate this gospel account. Now we must address who the intended audience was. To begin, it appears that one of John's intended audiences was, were those who are investigating the Christian claims and may be a bit skeptical of all of this recitation of the words and works of Jesus. You see that in chapter 20, verse 31. These are written so that you may, they haven't come to faith yet, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so some of his intended audience on one side was Jewish. You will notice that because he expects that some of his readers and listeners are familiar with the various religious Jewish feasts and the various religious paraphernalia. And so he will not explain those, uh, the rituals of the feasts or some of the intended meaning of the ceremonies. He just assumes that enough of his readers or listeners will understand it. He doesn't need to explain it. But on the other hand, he assumes and knows that some of the hearers and readers are non-Jewish, and so to help them along, he does a couple of interesting things. He explains 
what we might consider simple words that are Jewish, like rabboni or rabbi and Christ. And then at the very heart, the, the uh, uh, literary heart of this gospel, when everything begins to change at John 12, he makes sure to encourage non-Jews by recounting how Greeks had come to seek Jesus, how non-Jews had come to seek Jesus, and he welcomed them. Here's how it goes in John 12, 20-23. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And so it's there to encourage non-Jews that they too can come. And so one aspect of the audience that John intends are those who are uh, investigating the Christian claims, but maybe a bit skeptical of the words, the recitation of the history and the works of Jesus, whether Jews or non-Jews. But there's another side of the audience. Another intended audience was the Christian to help her in explaining her faith and why she believed in Jesus as Israel's Messiah and the world's true Lord. You cannot miss it when you come to John 13 through 17. There's almost no explanation. It's just a recitation of very rich, thick, substantive talk from Jesus and pictures from Jesus that are intended to fortify a Christian's faith. Oh, this is why we do these things. This is what we believe and why we believe it. So my friends... In other words, the audiences that John had in mind were people very much like us in the 21st century. And so John not only lays out or presents assumptions and has these assumed audiences in the back of his mind as he is writing, but John also had an aspiration. An aspiration. And what is John's aspiration? You heard it right there In John 20, verse 31, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's aspiration is faith. His aspiration is to germinate faith in those who are presently uncommitted. And so all the way through this gospel account, there will be uh, subtle but somewhat surprising moments when you realize John is making an offer. If you are reading and hearing this, then receive Jesus as He is freely offered in this gospel. For example, in the verses we read for our assurance of pardon in John 3, verse 35 and 36, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. All the way through this Gospel account, at certain places, John is giving readers an opportunity to finally rely upon Jesus and submit to Him. It's about germinating faith and those who are presently uncommitted. But also, John is striving stridently to standardize, to stabilize, and to strengthen the faith of Christ's followers, especially in the face of socially systemic skepticism. That's why notice around verse chapter 21, verse 24, that John brings in this statement in John 21, 24, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we, we know that his testimony is true. Around this gospel account, there is a community whose faith is being fortified and they are now joining their voices to the voices of all the witnesses in the gospel. John wrote this not only to germinate faith in those presently uncommitted, but to stabilize and standardize and strengthen the faith of Christ's followers. 
And so these people, this community is centered on this gospel and centered upon its veracity. But they are also, you'll notice in chapter 21, 24, they are curators, curators of this record. They're adding their voices to it and they're going to make sure to be part of it going out to others. They're curators of the record. And so the gospel according to John intentionally calls together, knits together, and shapes together the community of Christ, and then the community responds by bearing witness to the deposit entrusted to it. Now, my friends, we are ready. After hearing the, um, the assumptions and thinking about the audiences and listening and looking at the aspiration, we are now ready to advance our way through this gospel account, if you will advance. My friends, as we advance our way through this, through John's account of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, we need to be prepared. There's at least four areas we need to be prepared. First off, we need to be prepared to come to terms with who Jesus is and the claim he has on us. We need to be ready to come to terms with who Jesus is and claim and the claims he has on us. All the way through, we will hear, Jesus, the Father has given me the authority to give life to whomever I will. The Father has given me authority to judge the living and the dead. The Father has given me authority to be the way, the truth, and the life so that no one can come to the Father but through me. Those are bold and strong and strident claims that Jesus makes, not only about himself, but the claims that he actually makes on our lives. So we need to be prepared first to come to terms with who Jesus is and the claims he has on us. And secondly, we need to be prepared to be strengthened in the reality that the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. That the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. When we walk away from John, our confidence should be blossoming. Thirdly, we should be prepared to be encouraged to hold the line in the onslaught of skeptical and cynical questionings. We should be prepared to become ready to hold the line in the onslaught of skeptical and cynical questionings. All the way through this gospel account, you get the feel, you get the sense, okay, this is written so that way I can be a part of answering the opponents of the faith, those who are looking at Jesus, those who have questions about Jesus. I'm being given this to be able to say to them, no, this is true, and that he is the truth, and so forth. Here's the fourth part of the advance. We need to be prepared. Be prepared to be spurred on to join the ranks of the company of the witnesses of Jesus. When we get done with the Gospel of John, it's not intended for us to be spectators because Christianity is not a spectator sport, right? We are intended to be spurred to join the ranks of witnesses of who Jesus is. In other words, we must come to this Gospel record with the anticipation that it will impact us. It will engage us. It will enlist us. We need to come with that anticipation. So there we've, we've listened and thought about the assumptions and the audiences. Um, we've heard of the aspiration. We've gotten ready with the advance. Finally, we need to lay out some arrangements. So here are some arrangements. It's going to take us about a year and a half to work through the gospel according to John. A year and a half. And so, read the gospel according to John. Don't read it one time and think you're done with it. Read it four times in the next year and a half. <laughs> I'm just giving you a number. If you can read it more, God bless you. If you can't make it to four, that's fine. But shoot for four times and read it this way. Read it the first time in smaller segments. There are 21 chapters that will take you 21 days. Read one chapter a day, 21 chapters. But read it. And then about three months later, do this in, in quarters. Three months later, read it in bigger sections. This is where that chart will help you out by GM Burge that I sent to you. 
He shows you the bigger chunks that you ought to read it in. So read it then the second time, some months later, in those bigger chunks, looking for the themes. How do these chapters all fit together under this theme? And then about three months later, come back and read it one chapter a day for 21 days. And then at least at the final reading, three months after that, read it again in big chunks looking for those big themes. And so read the gospel, read it more than once. But secondly, watch for the big words and the big subjects, the big themes. There are several. I'm going to give you a list of them. If you've got your sermon notes open, if you look down to the third question for your care group, I have listed for you there the words specifically and how many times they are used. But let me go through them very quickly. Here are some of the biggest words you will hear uh, Pastor West next week talk about these when he, when he gets into John 1, 1 through 18. He will, you will hear these in the scripture reading, but they run all the way through this gospel. Life. Life is used 36 times from John 1 to John 36. Usually it's eternal life or everlasting life or that you may have life, etc. But it's used 36 times. It's huge. Another one is light, L-I-G-H-T. Light shows up some 23 times and eight of those times it is in stark contrast to darkness. So eight of those times, it is in stark contrast to darkness. Witness or testimony or testify, those are almost always the same family of Greek words that are underneath those, and those Greek words are almost are always the word martyr. Martyr. It's a huge word. It's why we called this series Witness, because the whole book is about witness, It's used 47 times. It rises up 47 times. You even heard it when we read 1 John chapter 5, 1 through 13. You can't get rid of that word. It's extremely important. Witness, testimony, testify. Another word is the word world. The Greek word is the same. It's cosmos. All the way through the Gospel of John, it surfaces 78 times cosmos. But here's what you need to recognize. It's used at least three different ways. The word world is used three different ways at least. In one way it's used, it's only simply referring to creation alone. You'll hear that in the very first few verses of John chapter 1. This refers to creation alone. But in other places and in the predominancy, it is used in positive ways and negative ways to mean more than just creation but something to do with humankind. So in positive ways, you heard the call to worship, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc. There the word cosmos, referring to creation and some aspect of humanity, is used in a very positive way. But the overwhelming use is in highly negative ways, such as John 15, 19. If you were of the world... The world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. There it's used in negative ways. Well, what does world mean? Well, we'll unpack it more as we get into it, but just put it very simply. All the people using their religious, patriotic, law-abiding activities and actions and other actions to oppose God, whatever they have, using it to oppose God, okay? There it is very quickly in a nutshell. But world is used, surfaces 78 times, and it's used in three different ways. So pay attention as you're reading and ask yourself when you see the word world, how was John using that word here? The biggest one is probably the word believing. Believing and faith, it runs thick 98 times. Now, clearly, most of those times, or a large number of those times, it is a part of a tension. Those who believe and those who do not believe. That's how you'll see the word used in many places throughout John. The believing and the not believing. But you will also, and I want you to pay attention because this is kind of our subtitle of the series. If you saw the picture that was sent out, uh, was put out on Facebook, the subtitle. There are those who believe Jesus because of the wow... 
And there are those who believe Jesus because he is the way. They believe the wow or they believe the way. And you will see that and pay attention. Look for it. It's bigger than you imagine. It's actually pretty well all the way through the gospel. Then the last is this. Truth. At least the last for the sermon. The word truth, which surfaces for air 25 times. Truth. Look for those big words and big themes. Circle them in your Bibles. You know, uh, write out a, uh, whatever you need to do to pay attention to those. Write those out. Look for other big themes and big words as you read through. You will be richly um, uh, encouraged and you will be uh, deeply helped. Next then, while you're reading through, write down your own questions as you see them, uh, 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 as we go through, as you go through, and then as we go through, write down your questions. I'm going to encourage you to get a composition notebook or a pad of paper or whatever venue you use. And when you have a question, write the address down and then put the question there. And then when we get to that passage, see if it isn't answered. Your question isn't answered. If it isn't, come talk to us but more than likely it will be answered most times. Then go back to your composition notebook, open it up, and put down the answer so that you will have that resource for years to come. So write down your questions and also write down the answers when they come. But also, as we go through John, as you read through John, keep asking yourself this question. What does this mean for me? Now, that's a different question than what does this mean to me? You right? You understand the difference? What does this mean for me, for my life, for my destiny, for my purpose? What does this mean for me? And lastly, dear friends, I encourage you to pray. To pray for the aspiration of this gospel account to have full, flourishing fruit in your life, in your family's life, and whoever hears this, and what is that you're praying for? Faith. John says it this way in 1 John 5, verse 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And then in John 20, verse 30 and 31, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are grateful. We are so excited to get into the gospel according to John. We pray, Lord God, that you would guide us, you would help us that we would not only be good students to let data just rumble around in our heads, but Lord, we would come with the anticipation. The Holy Spirit inspired anticipation that this gospel will impact us. This gospel will engage us. This gospel will enlist us because your spirit is attending this gospel account as it is read and recited. And your spirit is coming to work life, to bring faith so that we may have life and have it abundantly. Oh Lord, we pray that you would come and move in our hearts as we work our way through this gospel account. In Jesus' name. Amen.